Um, what, I, what I wanted to focus on um, with this particular talk today, it's talk about Juniper design, but we will also touch uh, with Juniper maintenance and, and basic care and how do we treat them, especially how we should treat them in the tropics because there's some, some difference that we should take into consideration growing junipers in the tropics versus you know growing junipers in temperate climates okay who has killed junipers i've killed hundreds <laughs> <laughs> so so what's the what's the main issue with junipers we know that there's something about them that you need to be careful of what's the what's their main their main thing what what's what's really is the main juniper killer that we know of the, the water often Water, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, and what is the, the biggest uh, problem? You don't see a juniper in the landscape doing just fine, right? Just, just, just like this guy right here, you'll have them in your yards and they'll, and they'll grow and they'll be healthy and they'll, 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 they will have spiky shoots, deep green foliage, but then we move them into bonsai pots and we kill them with love, with love, right? What is too much love in the case of junipers? Overwatering. Over trimming, uh, over bending the limbs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but most conifers they take very well to bending of branches, especially conifers that have uh, thick uh, life bark. They take very well to bending, and I mean everybody has you know seen the magazines about how amazing you know how amazing are the transformations that these you know artists can do on junipers. Uh, so why is it that it doesn't work for us? Why is it that we try to bend junipers and we kill them? Why is it that we try to keep junipers and kill them? Well, number one, let's go back to the watering subject. A tree in the soil is very different than a tree in a container. Pretty much we have free drainage in the soil. We know that Florida soil is very, very sandy, right? So it drains very well. We have no problem with that. We do have problem when we take that native soil and, and we put it in a bonsai container because a bonsai container you know it has limited drainage and these guys naturally they grow where where do they come from naturally junipers they grow on ledges in rocks so picture this environment you have this juniper growing sitting on a ledge and it's got perfect drainage it's got no soil <coughs> roots are pretty much growing into minute cracks between rocks and they're just getting all this heat and they're getting this dry environment in their roots. But where do they get their moisture? From the air. From the air. They get it from the morning dew. So anytime you see a structure like this in, in biology, kind of picture lungs. Lungs are highly ramified inside, right? The alveoli inside lungs. These are meant for exchange, meaning to give out and to take in, right? So what are we taking in? Moisture from the year when we have such a highly ramified structure like this. So I think everybody has heard the advice, what do you do when your juniper is kind of not looking so good? You missed it. Why do you miss it? Because there is something wrong with the root system, meaning water is not reaching the tips, okay? So if a juniper is unhealthy, somebody might say, hey, give it some water, it looks dry. And actually it might be the opposite, it is dry, here, but it means that the roots are not taking up enough water. So how do we get from a healthy juniper to such a not healthy juniper? If we completely saturate the root ball once, twice, three times a day, that's really not the conditions that they evolved in, okay? They evolved to grow in really dry soils. So they definitely need to dry daily. If, if the weather is too hot, yes, they can take watering twice a day, but it just depends on the rate with which this tree is taking up water. But definitely, you should allow your junipers to dry this much. And you can, you can feel the soil and see how, how dry it is. Okay, it's not, it does, it's not holding any moisture in. It's about as dry as it can be. And this is the point at which you come in and water. So, do you, what times do you water normally? I guess most people, you know, they have a nine to five job, you know, Monday to Friday, so they'll water early in the morning. Meaning what? Meaning the tree will be a little wet from the day before, you'll soak it with water, and probably 
you're not allowing that pot to dry. Granted, it will stay dry for the rest of the day, but it will not be getting that water when it needs it most, which is when? <coughs> Around noon, right? Which is the most stressful time. It is when trees start transpiring the most. And then one o'clock to 2 p.m., it's dry, so stoma shut down. You know, the pores and the leaves, they shut down and the trees uh, stops taking in water, okay? So in Japan, pretty much we allow the trees to dry out in the morning and we water once or twice a day, depending on how strong the tree is growing. So normal watering is about 10 a.m. A second watering, 2 to, to, 2 to 3 p.m., depending on the weather. If it's too hot, we water earlier. If it's overcast and maybe a, you know, a little uh, rainy, uh, we might not water or just delay the watering till the late afternoon. But when we do the second watering, we will only uh, water the dry trees. Yes, sir. If I'm waiting till I get home at five o'clock, is that too late to be watering? Am I stressed? It might. It might be a little too late because then the trees might not have enough time to dry out. But it just depends in your area because some areas might have, you know, longer daylight. It depends on how many hours of sunlight you have in your backyard. I mean, some people don't have any sunlight past four o'clock yeah, from shade, yeah. from all the buildings, from all the trees. If you have, I've seen yards, you know, where people get sunlight, you know, until seven o'clock at night, right? So maybe watering at five o'clock might not be a problem. It just depends on how much light you're getting. So point number one, when, it, when you're watering junipers, let them dry. You let them dry thoroughly and then you water deeply till the water runs through the drainage holes. So it's this cycle of wet, dry, wet, dry that makes those juniper roots grow which kind of mimics what happens in nature. I mean, they're not growing in constantly moist pockets of soil, which trees grow uh, in constantly moist soil? Ball cypress, <coughs> buttonwoods. So you take away from nature and you apply that to bonsai culture. You know that ball cypresses and buttonwoods, they do love a lot of water. It's pretty hard to overwater them, actually. But a juniper, you can't kill it, you can't kill it with extra <coughs> water. Um, when I started doing bonsai in Costa Rica, I was the, the juniper guy. I mean, I was the one killing all the junipers because I, I saw them out in the landscape and I was thinking, there's got to be a way to do this. Why did they keep dying? And then when I moved from having organic components in my soil mix to a 100% inorganic uh, soil mix, then I started having success. And then I started having success with bending and carving dead wood and doing all the extreme things that junipers can take. So what is the main difference between, for example, wiring and bending this tree that is in nursery soil than wiring and bending a tree that is close to 100% lava. So back home, we don't have a pumice source. We don't have an akadama source. So pretty much all I had was uh, lava and some organics to play with. And I noticed as I was reducing the organics, I was moving from compost then I was uh, trying rice husks, then I was uh, trying coconut coir, uh, or coir, is that the correct word, coconut coir? Like coconut hus husk? Yeah. Husk. I was yeah. trying that in the, in, the, uh, in the soil mix also. And the more inorganic <laughs> I went, <laughs> the healthier the junipers turned out to be. So that I had, I, I figured it out on my own. It took me kind of like 10 years to figure it out. I had no teachers, nobody to teach me. And then I come here and I study with Boone and he said, yeah, don't use any organic. So that shows the value of perhaps, you know, learning from somebody who has done that species of bonsai successfully and applying that immediately in your bonsai culture. I mean, we, we build on the knowledge and the experience of others. And this is kind of cool in the bonsai hobby, right? It's not, everything is not in a book. It's out there in the community because we're all doing different species, different climates, uh, different techniques. Um, so as I also, moved... Also, with you yeah. talking about junipers, everybody here remember what he's saying is only about junipers, about watering. Yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, every tree needs he's different... He's not talking about everything on your benches. Yes, definitely. This is a juniper talk. Juniper talk. We have a lot of yeah. new people. Okay, okay. <laughs> So, having said that, when I moved from organic mix to an inorganic mix, I was doing all this bending, heavy cutback, carving, and my trees stopped dying. Why is that? When you do heavy bending, you inevitably, inevitably will make miniature fractures in the branch, in the living tissue, in the, in the xylem of the tree, in the transport tissue of the tree. So, naturally leaves 
will stop transpiring for a bit. You know, that's until the tree starts to heal and make new wood, and then the tree starts moving again, sucking up uh, that water. But the problem is when you style a tree that is in an organic mix, this soil stays too wet. Think about it. We're cutting this back, we're bending it, we're stressing the tree, and the whole system comes to a halt, it's not sucking up any more water. So again, one of the big killers when you're working with junipers is you, you work on a tree and normally we work them pretty hard, the soil stays too wet for too long. It becomes waterlogged. However, when you're working with a juniper that is in a dry soil mix and an organic soil mix, you work on a tree and the soil just drains perfectly. It's not waterlogged at all. So this is my experience that I'm sharing with you. And when I went to Japan, I was lucky to see how they do it. And it was pretty similar. Actually, the soil mix that we use at my teacher's nursery, one part akadama, one part pumice, uh, sorry, one part akadama, one part pumice, one part river sand. Now this is uh, pretty much silica, 100% silica. Why do we use river sand? Uh, this is not the sand that you get from the ocean because the salt will burn the tree, of course. Uh, but why do we use a dry particle? The drier the particle, is it better or is it worse? For the juniper. It's better for the juniper, right? Not for every tree, but for a juniper, it works better. So what did we do when we had a really weak juniper? We put it in 100% river sand. 100% river sand. Yeah. Nothing else, sand. Yeah. But we're, taking, we're talking coarse sand. Right. Almost like, like fish well, tank well, sand. A lot of sand is pretty, you know, pretty, like river sand almost. Yeah. yeah. No. So if you, if you think about mm -hmm. that, no. you know, no. you might want to consider number one, not using sand straight up from the ocean, because <laughs> it's right. gonna be salty going to burn the tree and it might be too fine you need to find sand that is bonsai size in particle meaning over uh, one eighth of an inch okay that's it's pretty cool no. <laughs> no, Florida sand no Florida sand works pretty yeah. good too though it works for, work for me it doesn't drain well that's the problem it's too fine when, if you were going to order that online or something what would you actually be I, I've gotten it at uh, landscape businesses not they, not they online see. yeah just just ask for river sand for river and they can sand. you know hook you up with <laughs> rocks because that's you, what it is pretty you're much. talking a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch kind yeah of yeah size. exactly that's hard to come by it is yeah. mm -hmm. I have some but I don't yeah. use it much I use sandblasting sand because you can buy it in different sizes mm. and you can get coarse sandblasting sand but you start getting stuff that's a sixteenth of an inch yeah that would be that would be that ideal and also make sure that it's silica, that it's not granite, because different granites can have kind of like basic pH, but silica is completely neutral, and you don't want to, you know, um, throw off the pH of the soil. Okay, so you want you want something that's glass, pretty much, something that doesn't interfere with the chemistry of the soil. Can you but spell that word? Silica? Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, I'm sure. Silica. I know. I see it. Silica. Okay. So, silica. but basically, like your your um. My okay. mix now, my mix now, this is just uh, and that lava, means, yeah. pumice, and there's a little bit of uh, uh, expanded shale in there. Because two years ago, when I first came to Florida, that was the closest, driest particle that I could find. Now, you know, I, I buy uh, sand from the local landscaping, but expanded shale works pretty well as a dry particle. Because I just bought one at the um, auction, and like you said, you got a lot of brown stuff mm -hmm. on top, mm -hmm. and it's in a deep. So, so, like so when we have when off. we have something like this, don't keep it soaking wet. Yeah. Allow that tree to. You need to allow the top soil to dry out, and still, when the okay. top soil dries out, it means that it's still wet on the bottom. So you might still want to allow it a day more to really dry out to the bottom and then water it th thoroughly. But misting is the best thing I can do for it. Misting, it's ideal, especially when you have, when you have styled a tree and it's gone through a lot of stress. When you recently collected a juniper, you keep the soil dry, but you mist it a lot. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a, a, a tree right now uh, at my place. Imagine a shohen juniper, it has no roots on it because it had root rot and I'm trying to rescue it. And what, I'm, what I did is I took it out and this is, this is pretty much rescue method for junipers. But right? you only can do this 
This is, this is an emergency procedure because okay. it had root rot, complete root rot. How do you tell if a plant has root rot? Stinky. It's stinky, right? It's quite stinky. And you take off, you, you, you grasp the roots and the skin just peels off so, e so easily, like a mush. So when you have root rot on a juniper, you need to wash off all the soil. Then you need to come in and cut all the affected roots, dead roots, rotten roots, and just try to get to the nice, healthy, red roots, okay? Juniper wood, uh, juniper bark, healthy bark, is reddish in color, and especially roots. Okay, but when, when is it, like, it, you can do this any time of the year, or? Junipers, junipers you can repot any time of the year as you provide appropriate aftercare. That's another thing about junipers. Ah. So we'll talk, we'll, we'll go a little oh. into, into the repotting. I'm just sharing what to do yeah, if you yeah. have a juniper with root rot. So I removed all the rotten roots. I put it in straight pumice. I covered the soil with plastic. Of course, I watered it, right? I watered it. I soaked it in the fungicide to take care of the root rot. I think uh, the active ingredient was a propiconazole on it. Let me write it down. <laughs> But pretty much any fungicide that takes care of uh, Phytophthora, which is root rot, should do the trick. But you need to dip. Definitely you need to dip for a couple of hours at least to get you know, that, that fungicide into the tree's uh, xylem and into the tree system to be able to fight the root rot. So then I, I, I dip it in the, in the fungicide, I water it thoroughly, I cover the pot, and then I put it in a mist house. And it's getting missed for five minutes, three times a day, just feeding, feeding the foliage. And essentially, the tree becomes a huge cutting, right? Mm -hmm. So with junipers, when you have this problem, you want to keep as much green as possible, as possible because that green is going to make sugars that are going to go into the roots and going to start making callus, and then that callus is going to start making roots. Okay? So that's how you root a juniper that had root rot. Plant it in pumice, treat it with a fungicide. You cover the soil because that soil, I mean, we've had, the, we've had that tree in a greenhouse for two weeks. The soil's still wet. It doesn't have any roots, so the soil will still stay wet. Now, the ideal environment is 100% humidity, but not <laughs> to root it, right, as a cutting, but not in the soil. So as, as, as long as the soil dries out, then I know, oh, the juniper started making roots, and then I need to start watering slowly, a bit more frequently. But right now it's had no it's had no water and I'm just misting it three times a day. Yes. Well, how about wee little pebbles? Just we use a pebble that we put into our compost, I mean our <coughs> club soil. Mm. Wee little pebbles, would they be good and they don't if if you can get them small enough. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But for rooting pumice. For rooting pumice, definitely. Now let's talk a little bit about juniper maintenance. And if I may uh, Cut a little, a little branch off the tree. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about uh, healthy, healthy versus weak. How do you tell that your juniper is nice and healthy? Which one is the healthy one? Which one is the weak one? I think it's pretty obvious that the left one is pretty healthy and the right one is pretty weak. How do you tell? The left one has a, an extending tip a really, really a strong, vibrant, uh, dividing, a vibrant green tip. This is what makes junipers indestructible, pretty much. Why is that? Because you have so many apexes here, so many apical meristems, that if one of these guys dies off, then another one can take behind it. Many trees, they'll have the you know, apical meristem, but if that bud comes off, you, know, you have limited buds behind it, but junipers, they have plenty of buds, okay? What's the main difference with a weak branch? A weak branch does not have this strong extending tip, meaning that it's programmed to die. You can see that this branch has juvenile foliage, and that's another sign of weakness in junipers. Now, don't take uh, this prickly, spiky foliage that, you know, it's a sign that it's gonna die, but in some varieties, definitely it's a sign of weakness. Most junipers, or at least the ones that we work on as bonsai, most of them, they will have a soft, 
mature scale like foliage. It's not prickly to the touch. So these are the kinds of junipers that we want to work with because they make nice, soft clouds of foliage, right? Why do we love junipers so much? Because they look nice and puffy, right? <laughs> so we cannot achieve that if we work with weak branches. That's why when we're styling junipers, we remove all the weak branches. And you'll see that on the tree that I brought to the end of the day. I already did all the cleanup because that's boring work to do you know, in front of an audience. So pretty much I, I took all the hanging branches, all the weak hanging branches, I cut them off, removed them. Because if I style the tree with these branches, they're not gonna contribute to the overall health of the tree. So if I have a tree, if I have a branch, let me see if I have another. Oh, this is better. If I have a branch with strong branches and weak branches, all of these guys are taking energy, right? They're taking energy from this pipe. So if I remove the weak branches, will these guys grow stronger or weaker? No, they will grow stronger. Yeah. Okay. So and it's easy for them to pick up the pace because they already have strong growing tips. So there's no delay in the pruning response. They just start growing right away. How about if we instead of Instead of doing that, we just keep the weak ones. And this, this is very tempting to do, right? Because usually the weaker ones, the weaker ones, they're inside, right? And the long ones, the strong ones, they're out here. And we're thinking, oh, well, you know, we want bonsai to be nice and tight <coughs> and compact, so I want to prune back to here, right? The problem is that, yes, you can do that, <coughs> but there's a risk involved. So sometimes a tree is not strong enough to do this big whack of a pruning. So there's three things that can happen. What is number one and the most common one? Okay. So these guys, the unhealthy guys, these are already programmed to die. They're gonna drop off, turn yellow in one, maximum one and a half, two years, okay? So these are programmed to die. Number one, they can die, right? If they die, they can take the whole branch and you lost your branch, okay? But they can also die and bud at the crotches, right? So we know that the place where junipers make new buds, adventitious buds, is right at the divisions of branches, right at the crotches of branches. So these guys can die, but it, they can also dry out and bud. So we can either have complete dieback, meaning the branch dies, sorry, the, the ramification dies, and the whole branch dies, or we have dieback and budding out, okay? So if it buds out, it might bud out really weakly. Why? Because the tree has to spend all this energy in making new foliage from this bud. So that this actually effectively weakens the tree. The tree has to invest resources in making all this foliage area, all this surface area. What happens if there's no buds? Sometimes we'll have the little weak buds and they will just hang on. They will hang on and will not progress. Why? Because the tree is starting to push this, but there's no actual tips, there's no actual buds. And that's very common when you see this happening. We are all instructed to pinch trees, okay? So, is it a valid technique? Yes, it is a valid technique. Is it uh, an old technique in bonsai? Yeah, I mean, this bonsai dates back like 200 years in Japan, more in China. So yeah, it is a valid technique. However, you need to understand that if you pinch a weak branch, it's likely gonna die because you're taking all the growing tips out of it. Now, you take a, a strong branch, let's say you pinch it, this is not gonna die because you, you have all these hundreds of growing tips around it. So when is the appropriate time to use this technique? 
when a tree is mature and ramified. So if, let's say for example, this is a tuft of foliage in a mature tree, what do I do if I want to maintain the tree? Be, you know, back in the day, pinching was pretty common. However, you have the red tip, sorry, the, the brown tips. So to avoid having that look of brown tips, <coughs> that technique evolved into removing the center shoot and just keeping all these guys around it green and healthy and growing. So we have an old technique that because of the browning that occur in tips, evolved into something else. It's just, it's the same <coughs> thing. We're just taking, you know, the apical meristem, but it's just the same thing. Essentially, we're just removing the tip. Now, this is a refinement technique. It's not a, it's not a development. Uh, development technique. See how healthy this tree is and how much how much foliage and back butts we have on the inside, right? We have a lot of things going on here on the crotches of branches. How do we get junipers to back butt? We don't get junipers to back butt from pruning <coughs> constantly. We get junipers to back butt by allowing them to grow strong. So we talked about repotting. Let's talk about pruning. Can I ask one thing before yes. you go on? Yes, Juan? please. So last year, all of my junipers had the spider mites. Yes. And so I had a lot of those weak branches after it was treated. I cut all the weak ones off. Okay. And so okay. now all new branches have come out over the year and everything. And so, but every so often there's a weak one. Is the best thing just to cut that weak one off if it comes up every so often? Whenever you have a weak one, Yes, it's part of juniper maintenance to keep <coughs> cutting the weak branches off. Okay. Why? Because if we always try to keep healthy foliage and we try to keep the tree growing, whenever you do the maintenance, which is what I'm going to talk about now, this is something that you do in July or the hottest time of the year. Uh, in Japan, junipers are worked in the summer, hottest time of the, of the year. Why is that? Because you cannot touch any other tree. Every other tree is just stressed from the high temperatures. Junipers can take it. <coughs> So what is normal work for junipers in the summer? You'll see that all the healthy tips, they are right here at the end of the branch and you, you will have the weaker branches on the inside. So summertime, what you do is remove the inside weaker branches. Now you're thinking, oh wow, this tree is becoming leggy. This is not beautiful. It looks like a plug chicken, actually. Right? <laughs> so, the idea behind this is like any tree, who defoliates their trees? I defoliate my trees. Can you defoliate a juniper? No, it's gonna die, <laughs> right? So what do you do if you can't defoliate your tree? You remove the inside weak leaves to let light inside, okay? And then that strong tip that you had, already cut it off, but we're gonna do it again just to you know, demonstrate. We remove the inside branches and we cut the tip. Okay, so this will promote axillary buds to develop from these areas. These are crutches of branches right here, right? We're not cutting right at the branch. We're leaving a tiny little stub to keep that crotch intact. If you keep the crotch, if you keep just a little stub, it might as well just bud from there and you'll have the tip. So. Step one, clean, clean up the weed. And by clean up, I mean remove it or address it. So clean up the weed foliage and remove the tips. But this is on a healthy juniper and this is maintenance that you do once a year. You don't have to keep on top of it. You only hit it when it's the strongest and typically mm -hmm. that is the summertime. Can you do it later than summer? Yes but you need to allow the juniper enough growing season to recover from that pruning because what's gonna happen once you remove this tip, it will divide and you'll have ramification. And if the juniper was strong enough, you will have things shooting up inside also. And then when the juniper is way too long for its size, then you come back and you cut to foliage inside. So for example, a branch like this, if, I'm, if I ever think that it's too long, I just cut back to inner 
inner branches. You always want to keep these guys inside as healthy as possible. You'll see, for example, that in, in this long branch, there's a healthy bud coming from the inside. If ever this becomes too long, too leggy, I will always have the option to cut it back to here. So what is appropriate cutback on a juniper? You will always cut back to a healthy, strong tip. Don't cut back to weaker foliage. Cut back to strong branches. And then those branches will start growing right away. What do we have right here? You guys see this? It's a little berry, right? Should we take it? Should we remove it? Is it better for the tree? Is it worse? I like to remove them. Remove them, yeah. Berries can take up a lot of energy. You know, these are babies in the making. So, of course we know babies are expensive. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if we want our juniper to grow healthy and spend all its resources on itself, we're gonna call it the, you know, a selfish juniper because it doesn't want to spend on babies. Um, Did you just lose your fiance? No, 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 she's, she's funny. She knows her plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have covered pruning, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna cover <coughs> wiring and bending. We know the type of soil that we need to be able to be successful in this kind of maneuvers. We also need to talk about the uh, time um, to do this kind of work. So, junipers in, let's say, temperate areas, you have a very defined spring, a very defined summer, a very defined fall, and a very defined winter. And to a degree, we have that here, right? Summer is not as hot, right? Uh, still, we're, I, I was told that we're experiencing record heat in this area. Uh, Melbourne is actually quite cool now. The nights are kind of cooler. Uh, and the, I, you notice, for example, during this time, with junipers in temperate areas, they're moving a lot of water, right? Moving a lot of water means that that light bark is gonna be chock full of nutrients, chock full of water. So if you bend them during that period, what's gonna happen? That light bark is gonna just pop. It's very easy to, to just pop it off the branch. That's the reason why you use raffia when you're bending branches, to keep that light bark tightly attached to the branch. So if you're bending junipers during the growing period, it's even wise to apply raffia or any protective kind of material. I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, devoted to raffia. I, I use plenty of other materials, but I just like that the strand of raffia is pretty narrow, so you can wrap it around fine branches also. So if you really want to protect your tree, if you're going to work it during the growing period, definitely use raffia. So spring to summer, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous time to work on your tree. Why? Because the bark slips off so easily from the wood. So when is a good time to work on junipers? The height of the summer. Again, why? Because trees will go into a little dormancy period where they will not be moving as much water and then that bark sticks a little better to the wood, to the underlying wood. So there's a, there's a window here during hot weather when you can do bending, okay? Is it stressful for the tree? Yes. Do you want to do it on a super healthy tree? Yes. Would you want to work on a weak tree during the summer? No. Okay? So what is the other window? When temperatures fall a little bit during our fall season, still you have growth. You can clearly see this tree uh, growing. So as we move into the winter, we'll have a little bit of growth, and then winter time, growth slows down again. So again, fall to winter is another window where you can bend your trees again, or work them, style them. It's another great window to, to work on them. In true tropical areas, th this doesn't apply. There's no such thing, okay? so. How do you cope with the fact that the juniper is going to be chock full of water all the time? You allow it to dry so that there's not much water content in the branches and then that live bark will stick better. 
to the branch as you bend. And of course, you protect the branches with raffia. Uh, who uses other materials uh, than raffia? What do you guys use? Uh, plastic tape. Electrical tape? Okay, that's, that's one option. Uh, there's also... Uh, we can't find your tape. But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to find here. I guess I'll have to bring some uh, next time. Uh, there's a really good tape at Home Depot. It's a self-adhering kind of latex tape. You can pass it around if you guys want to see. Very stretchy, like water pipe. Yeah. Yes. Just for water pipe. Yeah, like ceiling ceiling tape for yeah. for uh, pipes. You can also use vet tape, which is the tape they use for yes. Grafting yes. Tape. So so you could use wait, wait, grafting that, tape. It's again. vet tape. Like animal vet. Yeah. Yeah. The most important part about this is to apply it tight. You don't want to apply it loose. It has to be tight. It has to hold that bark in place. Because you're, when you're doing big bends, well, these are not big bends, but when you're doing significant bends, you'll be breaking that branch at some point. I mean, one crack is OK. Two cracks are <laughs> never OK. It means you just snapped it off. Uh, but you will be making some, some cracks along that branch. So that's why you want to protect it. Um, some people say only use materials that breathe and never use uh, plastic materials because they don't breathe, right? The, the whole idea behind the cast, you know, that the cast gets smelly inside and we don't want the branch getting smelly. Where do plants breathe? They breathe through their leaves. This is where air exchange and gas exchange happens. It doesn't happen through the bark especially in conifers where they have that thick bark, okay? So, does it matter what kind of material you use? No. Actually, my teacher in Japan, he uses just kitchen wrap, like kitchen saran cling wrap. Saran, wrap. saran wrap. Why? Because you can make several turns, so it can become really tight, really strong, and you can see through. When you're doing big bends, you can see the, the break happening, and you know how far to go. So that's the last material that he's using. Uh, however, you know, he was taught by tradition to use raffia. But that doesn't mean that it's the only material that we can, that we can use. Uh, talking about raffia a little bit, I brought a little bit with me. Uh, it's wet. So well, raffia, ra raffia blends in and makes it more pleasant to the eye. There is, <laughs> there is you know, there's that I point. Like that. Yeah. There is that point. <laughs> raffia. It's organic, right? It's a fiber of a raffia palm. Uh, you have to soak it in, one, in warm water. You have to make strands. So this kind of raffia you can get at Michael's, you know, a big bag, you know, that craft uh, shop, craft store. Uh, you make uh, bundles or four, five fibers. Ideally, you want raffia that has long and wide fibers like this. You don't want too many stringy fibers because it's not going to hold well. You want those fibers to overlap so there's no weak spots in your bending. So when you're applying raffia around the branch, you want to overlap it, right? About 50%. And you want to make sure that there's no open spots there. What's the problem with raffia? It's wet, it's messy, and it takes time to prepare, right? So what happens when you're, you know, putting raffia on these branches and all of a sudden you run short and I'm like, Beatrice, come help me. I need your help. <laughs> so make me some raffia bundles, wet them and you know, during the whole time and just holding the raffia, you know, waiting, doing nothing. So that's why people use other materials, kind of like plastic tape and all that. Yes? If you've gone to all this trouble and you're bending this branch and all of a sudden you hear it crack, mm -hmm. what do you do besides pray? <laughs> okay, there's many things that you can do besides pray. Pray is good. Pray is good. <laughs> <laughs> that crack. So, that crack is going to... It's going to dehydrate, right? So, one thing I like doing is I put cut paste in that crack and I apply grafting tape on top to keep that that uh, area that's going to dehydrate, try to keep it moist and wet. That will help the callus roll over and heal. When it's a big, big crack, the Japanese professionals, they actually fill it up with sphagnum moss. And then they wrap around it. When it's something this big, just a bit of cut paste and some grafting tape on top. Can you use, for example, uh, 
electrician's tape to wrap on top, yeah, perfectly fine. As long as you seal that, that point of dryness. The other uh, recommendation that I would say, if you make a really big break, a significant break, where you feel that the branch is <laughs> kind of dangling and on the edge of just you know falling off the tree, don't do anything else to the branches. You might want to reduce some foliage a little bit, but don't style and wire the branches, okay? Why? Because that's extra breaks in that pipeline moving water to the, from the trunk to the tips of the branches. So when you break a big branch, just let it be. Let it be, and there's a good chance that it will heal. Conifers can take 50% of the diameter of the break. Oh, sorry, of the diameter of the branch. They can take breaks that big. Going into 75%, that's, that's like the dangerous <coughs> territory. But a 50% break, no problem, okay? So, yes? I'm sorry, I have a quick question yes. about another plant. Um, I have like a dracaena, and I uh -huh. accidentally broke one. Can I tape it back with raffia or something, do you think? I think so, but I mean, just depends on how woody it is. I don't know how well dracaenas heal, if at all. Yeah. So, of course you can experiment. Can if, it, if it's, if it's uh, still green after the break, probably it might be able to heal. So just stake it, tie it, and, and uh, okay. try to wrap it to prevent moisture loss from that break. Maybe. It's going to be a weak point always. A break is always a weak point, so you have to remember that. And you have to wrap the raffia wet. Now, after you get it wrapped, mm -hmm. and you leave it and you're waiting for it to, get the make, to protect the tree, do you keep the raffia wet? I just thought it when you water the... When you when mist you water, the tree, when you water the tree, the raffia naturally you gets wet. You should get enough to yeah. make sure it's wet. Yeah. Um, yeah some people don't like raffia. Actually, I think it looks crafty and nice. Yeah. I think it looks nice. I mean, I we too. we work bonsai. We work with our hands, and it's a craft, right? Um, so some people don't like raffia because it will <laughs> decompose on the tree, and then when it decomposes, it kind of sticks to the branch. On junipers, that's no problem because we will clean the live vein. Right, but then what happens? Uh, for example, if we're working with a pine, when we're applying raffia on the branches, what happens when that raffia breaks down and decomposes? It'll take the bark. With it. it will take the whole bark from that pine. So that's why some other materials, especially uh, materials that don't stick to the branch but rather stick to themselves, are really helpful when bending because you're not taking off that bark. I so have a yes. What aisle is that tape in? I don't remember. <laughs> that is in the... They have, they have a, an aisle of epoxies. I think it's next to the paint. <laughs> so I found that one right next to the epoxies. <laughs> so talking a little bit about juniper design. Yes. Well, the stretchy tapes, I mean, how can you get a stretchy tape on top? You have to some cut of those it. tapes are you, pretty... You have to cut it. You cut it lengthwise. No, not get it off, but I, I, I know you, not, not the self-seal tape. But when ah. you're applying uh, like that, plumbing tape is quite stretchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if you just kind of wrap it around there, you're not going to get it very tight. You have to really make You have it to accurate. really tight. That's yeah. it. You have to really yeah. tight. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know... So uh, wrap is very good. We're one one versus the other. Raffia, you have all these fibers getting caught up in the branches yeah. and you're getting wet and you know <laughs> you're making a mess yeah. with tape you have the little tape so sometimes the tape won't go around yeah. <laughs> the, you know there's small space between branches so you have to just make a decision what material will suit your situation best in this case I have a lot of branches congested up here so I know a roll of tape will not go through that's why I went with Rafia so don't marry yourself to you know a single technique there's many ways to you know cook the chicken and you know I'll make chicken soup. Um, talking about design in junipers, um, we fall in love with junipers because of their lush, soft foliage, right? And there's many ways to style them. And these are all perfectly fine. They're just differences between nurseries and how nurseries style trees. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Just checking on the time we have until, is it around 11? 
No, you can run. No, you can go. No. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, tilt. Yeah. No, tilt. Okay, okay, perfect. So, what do we notice about this tree that doesn't quite look like an old conifer? You have branches going up, right? Why do we style conifers with branches coming down? Showing age, make you more older. We look older. older. Why? Because they're flexible trees in general, and the tip of the, the weight of the branch tips tends to bring branches down. Uh, also, snow will bring branches down, and we also know that with age, they tend to break, but they tend to survive those breaks. So they break, and they can trail and snake in the ground, but still they will survive. So branches coming down, they're a sign of age on uh, conifers in general, not only junipers. However, let's go for another one. <laughs> There's degrees to how much of an angle down you want to give branches. When junipers have nice flowing curly <coughs> trunks, right? It's okay for them to have nice flowing curvy branches. If junipers are, or any conifer, has a straight trunk, we want straight branches coming down. It doesn't look right when you have a straight trunk tree and you have the little wiggly, wiggly, uh, squiggly, wiggly snake, you know, of, of a branch, it doesn't look right because it's not suiting, <coughs> suiting the character of the tree. So when you're building branches, you need to take into account the shape of the trunk. Okay, so if you have a curvy trunk, you can get away with curvy branches, snaky branches. If the trunk is straight, then making snaky branches doesn't really makes sense. Talking about the angles of branches, and this applies to conifers, right? All these angles should be similar. This is part of the Japanese mindset of styling trees. This is not something that, they say it's a natural rule, but of course <coughs> nature will break every rule, right? So if you style a conifer and you have some branches you know, going up and then down and then horizontal and then down, it kind of looks a little messy. It doesn't look artistically sound. Why? Because it's not consistent. The branch angles are not consistent. And then the design is not consistent. So if you have something like this on your tree, you think, okay, so this branch had all these years and all this snow and it's coming at this angle. Why is this branch growing up? It's a branch on the same tree. It should have had the same exposure to the elements, hence it should have about, you know, about the same angle. There's another way to make your trees look a little more natural than this, because you can argue that this looks very artificial, very stiff, right? So when branches are older, naturally they will sag down more. When branches are younger, they'll tend to grow up, right? This is just very natural phenomenon of every tree. Branches at the mid-level of the tree, they're close to horizontal, lower branches are, are coming down with a steeper angle, and then higher branches are growing up. So you see that the branch arrangement is kind of like a fan. Both ways of doing this are okay. They're perfectly accepted as long as you do it right. What doesn't look right is when you have branches going every which way. And the Japanese usually tend <coughs> to prefer this. I would say bonsai design in the West is gearing more towards this. So now, what we, now that we talked about branch angles, let's talk about branch construction. Yes? I found that cascading branches tend to lose vigor. If you bend the branch down, especially if you have a big branch and you swoop it down, Difficult yeah. to keep that branch healthy. Are there any tricks there? Or yes, don't there are it? tricks. Yeah. So when you have the mirror on your whenever you have pads on your trees, yeah, all right. Yeah. A pad is not only a st an aesthetic unit; it's also a growth unit. It's a solar panel. So if you have a weak branch, and you have all these guys growing strong, and you have this guy growing just a little bit. 
And this can be, you know, a whole compound of branches, like the cascade of the tree. What do you do to keep this healthy? Prune the top harder. You right, prune the top. Sun. You prune the top harder. Right. And even sun to get in. You might even want to thin it out. And then you don't touch the cascade. So this is something that you might do <coughs> year one and then you don't touch the cascade branch. And then year two, all these shoots and growth might be strong enough. Does and then help? year two, we come in, right? We, year two, this, the growth <coughs> might be more equalized, right? And then on year two, we come in and we treat the tree the same way. Remember, we're cutting junipers once a year, and we're doing it when? In July, right? So weak branches in July, you don't touch them. Strong branches, you cut back, you thin out. If a branch is weak, don't remove foliage on them. Keep as much foliage as you can. Does it help to spray it with a foliar feed? Yes, it does help. We, we, we talked about junipers being able to absorb water through their leaves. Foliar feed is, a uh, effective depending on the species and that's because plants they have you know they have the leaf and if you cut the leaf crosswise you'll have a little cuticle layer pretty much a waxy layer so depending on how thick that waxy layer is on the leaves they can take a foliar feed you know better or worse than other plants pines depends on the pine some pines have really thick waxy needles I don't think that can take a polar fertilizer as well as something with uh, thin, fine leaves. But yeah, definitely junipers can, can take foliar feeding. What do you so use? So you say any spray type of foliar? Any type yeah. of, is yeah. what it is? Yeah. Miracle Grow. Miracle Grow. Yeah, that works perfectly fine. Anything with, with chelated uh, nutrients can go like right into the tree and you know, be absorbed immediately. What, was there a question back there? Nope. I'm just gonna. I've yep. been told that they take in nitrogen really well, but they don't take in the phosphorus and potash as well. Through the leaves, it, it could be. It could be a possibility. <coughs> yeah. In other words, it greens. So, them up. what what kind of fertilizer? This this might come as a surprise. Uh, I've seen uh, people, uh, well, actually professionals in Japan, they don't use foliar feed. They use sugar. What is, what is the product of photosynthesis? Sugars, sugar, yeah. right? Brown sugar. I don't know what kind sucrose. of sugar. I, I think, I think, sucrose. I think, sucrose. actually I think it's powder dextrose. Well, fructose is the one in the fruit. Like yeah. Powdered sugar, powdered sugar. Yeah, sugar? yeah but yeah. I mean, this is not like regular sugar that you get at the supermarket. It's, it's you, you have to get it at a chemical supply store. But they fold your feed it with that and then you kind of bypass photosynthesis and the trees get the sugars they need to you know, help it maintain its met metabolism while it's rooting. But don't they get sticky in ants? <laughs> they don't seem to have a problem. I mean, I don't know the concentration, but just sharing what I've seen. And it's, and it's, a, it's an interesting idea, yeah. right? Um, actually, I remember in college when I was um, while doing my biology uh, degree, um, when you apply sugars to a plant, exogenous, like from an outside source, sugars, photosynthesis goes up 30%. Just like that, just bypassing, bypassing all the <laughs> all the trunk, just going straight into the leaves. So that's an interesting idea when you're collecting yeah. trees. Okay, so we we're gonna talk about branch structure. What makes a Japanese tree or a Japanese bonsai kind of look like a Japanesey tree? It's how much detail goes into the branch placement, and this is something that we will do, you know, in depth in this tree. And I hope you guys are not too tired from you know all the talking. No. Yeah. no, no, no. Okay, we're okay, good. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, whenever you see a branch like this, like this guy here, right, it kind of looks like an arrow. This is naturally what juniper branches look like, like an arrow. <clears throat> what happens with arrow branches? They get really strong in the top, then as we move closer into the tree, the branches get weaker, right? So you don't want to build your branches as an arrow. You want to build your branches as a fan. So right from the very start, 
you want branches to divide sort of a fan shape. Fan shaped branches will have an equal distribution of vigor to all your tips. So if you don't do that early enough, the tips will get strong and then the inside gets weak. And then the inside dies and you end up with leggy branches. Are we gonna do that now? I don't think so. I'll try to keep as much foliage as I can. And then eventually, one year, two, year late, two years later, if the inside branches are strong enough, I might cut back to them and start building this fan-shaped pad. Now this doesn't look like a fan, but let me draw one that will look like a fan. Basically you just cut the apical tubes off, right? Yes. So we have a circumference of shoots, right? When you clean up a juniper, you have all these tips. How do you arrange them in a branch? Most times you will only have juniper tips right at the ends of the branches, right? What happens to all of this inside? How do we get that density? Because if you don't have it, how can you grow it? How can you grow the tree to be dense? Let's say, for example, that you start uh, wiring a tree. And actually, let me make this a little nicer. Make it into a fan shape. You start wiring a tree and you have four shoots. I mean, this branch has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shoots. We don't have as you know, many shoots to work with. When you see a nice ramified juniper, it can have hundreds of shoots in a single branch. How do you get that? So, what some people will do is they will clump all the shoots together and snake all the branches in to make it look tight. But it's not really dense. It just gives you the appearance of tightness. How do you get that, really? It might seem uh, contrary to uh, intuition, uh, but you actually have to spread shoots around. You don't want shoots shading each other. You want to give them space to grow, divide, and ramify. So what happens, what happens if I wire my juniper and all the shoots are close together in a nice row? They compete with each other. They're competing so they're not growing as strong as they could grow. If we spread them out, leaving at least a shoot's diameter in between, and this concept applies to every bonsai. This, this is important when you're building deciduous, this is important when you're building pines, this is important when you're building junipers. The size of the shoot uh, will dictate how, how far apart you, sh you should be spreading those branches, okay? If you spread them too far apart, you know, it's just gonna look leggy. Just the shoot size, the leaf size itself will dictate, and I, and I know this can get like pretty boring and technical, but I'm just sharing how we, how we do stuff. Um, so depending on the shoot size, that's the space, the spacing that you keep uh, between, between uh, tips of branches. When somebody gets really, really skilled at this, it can look artificial, right? <laughs> because you have even spaces, you know, kind of like, an, like a, an army row, pretty much, of shoots. It can look artificial, but that's not the end goal. This is just a temporary state in which we're growing the tree, right? So what will happen when these guys start to grow, after styling, this will be year one, right? Do we want to cut them back in year one? No, because they're not strong enough yet. What will happen in year two? They're really, really strong. Now sap is really starting to move through this branch, and then lo and behold, we start to get fat body on the inside. So what happens in year two? We can come in in July, cut the tips, and then those buds inside start growing out, filling the branch itself, okay? Now this is the, the, the mistake that we all did, that we all do. We style the tree, and then what do we do next year? We pinch it, or we cut it, right before, 
right before the tree starts setting those adventitious buds. So when you do the main styling, the bone styling, the main structure of the tree, uh, you pretty much don't touch it for two years until it becomes a bush again. And then you'll have plenty of adventitious shoots to cut back long branches, to fill out uh, branches. So what happens if we clump things together and we let them grow? By year one, by year one, we run out of space. So we have to thin it out and cut it. And it will look the same. It will not have progressed. It will not have ramified. So that's the idea behind opening up shoots versus closing up shoots. Opening up shoots, it's called development wiring. Closing them in, <coughs> it's called show wiring. It's fine to wire trees for the show, especially conifers, and make them look tight. But if you're wiring trees to develop them, you spread them out to the light, so you maximize the growth that each tip will get, okay? Now, so when you cut this, July of year two, by year three, you'll have all these nice shoots inside, giving you an actual pad, as opposed to just you know long branches that were snaked in to make them look tight. Everybody understood this? This is, this is pretty important because this tells you how to make a bonsai. You make the initial lines, you let it grow when it's strong, you cut it back and you get back bodies. It's the same with every tree. It's not different than making a tropical. What do we do with a tropical? We grow it, we, sorry, we wire it, we let it grow, and then we cut it back when it's the right size, right? And then we get back budding. Yeah, you're not always Same with junipers. <laughs> same, same idea with junipers. But it takes a while, it takes patience, you know, while the tree will become strong and healthy and become bushy, and then we come in and we do the thinning and the cutback, and then we rearrange those inner shoots. So Juan, Juan yes. was going to ask the question. So like I noticed on my oldest black pine yes. that the pads are like very, very heavy towards the ends mm -hmm. and all. And I wondered about the fact that they're starting to get crowded. Mm -hmm. But do you have to you have to wait for some back bud to form there to before you could cut it back to it, right? It, it, I would, before giving advice, I would like to see the tree in detail. Okay. because it depends on, on every case, it depends on every tree. I can say thin it out now, but it depends on the tree. Is it have the leaves hardened? Is it dense? Is it strong enough to be you know, taking a thinning out? So I, from what I remember, I wouldn't thin it out because okay. it's still, it's still kind of like okay. thin on the outside. Okay. okay, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the interesting part where we're gonna break some branches. <laughs> so, okay, enough with the talking, we're going to do some work, actual bonsai work. Uh, you have noticed um, this nice wood here. Um, how do we work on, on wood in junipers? Uh, some people do it with machines, some people prefer hand tools. I actually prefer hand tools. If you, for example, use... A hand tool like this, like a spherical concave cutter, right? You can actually lift a sliver of wood and it will give you a nice texture, right? All those hidden details in the wood will come out natural and pop, right? Which is something you destroy when you're working with machine. And you can pass on, you know, the little sliver of wood to see that all those details in this piece of wood are reversed on the tree, because they're just split off. Smells like cedar. Mm -hmm. Spread it, uh, spreading out, they're just splitting out naturally. Yeah. So, this tool, it's very useful for carving conifers, why? Because you can cut into the wood, roll the tool, and you will lift a sliver of uh, uh, wood, right? You can tear it out, and then you'll have a cut end here. Everybody sees the cut end? So what we do is we're gonna repeat it in the opposite direction, so we remove the cut end. Is this fresh or is this all dried up? Uh, this is dried up. So now you see here, we remove the cut on one end and the cut on the other end. So what do we do with this natural texture here? We want to smooth it out, right? Um, how do we smooth it out? There's many techniques to smooth it out. 
One is, you know, elbow grease. Just get a, um, a wire brush, a steel wire brush, and just um, brush it. That's perfectly fine. Can I see what you do? Yes. And this works in many trees. Actually, I, I do my buttonwoods the same way. So you will see a little indentation here. It, it will give you a natural texture. Okay, so we have to smooth this out to age it. Why does juniper deadwood um, looks like this in nature? Because it's highly resinous, and because of the environments in which they grow, they're exposed to sand, ice crystals, heavy winds. So over hundreds, thousands of years, the wood naturally gets polished. Uh, one way to do this, people use torches. The problem with torches is that you're burning the wood. <coughs> so you're kind of accelerating decomposition of the wood, right? If you burn something, it's just gonna decompose faster, <laughs> right? Have you noticed how, uh, for example, burned trees in the forest are more fragile, they tend to break easier? Mm -hmm. So that's why we try not to burn wood. Okay. Also, when you burn wood, <laughs> the outside, <laughs> I mean, there's tastes, there's, there's many, many different tastes in bonsai. You just have to understand, you know, the look you get. If you like it, go with it. I mean, uh, there's no bonsai police. Do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. It's our November program. Is yeah. No bonsai police. The bonsai police is burning. 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 There you go. With Tommy. We'll have fun. <laughs> with, you know, Tommy and Dad. Yes. I can say, you know, so I can reason out the, why I don't like the, it. The whole bend, when you first bending. strip when you first strip the branch mm -hmm. and you can heat it up and bend it and set it in place with the fire. That's something we will do here. Okay? Yes. I have a question. I'm I'm pretty new to bonsai, but just based what I know from trees is if they get girdled then they can't take up nutrients and they die. So how much bark on a juniper do you have to leave on in order for it to get mm. okay so is this really harming the tree? Is that what you're no. asking? Is it how, how far can you go? How deep can you go? How, well, more so, how much bark can you Surface remove? area. Surface okay. area. When you're carving, you are working on dead wood. Pretty much, okay, so if you, if you do a, a cut, yeah. Yeah. a cross cut of a tree. Here, just throw that mark away. Yeah, throw that mark away. I think you're gonna have to throw that one away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We will have what's called sap wood, and the inside is called heart wood. Hearts. Yeah, heart. Actually, I've seen it written two ways: hard wood and heart wood. But I think it's heart heart wood. <laughs> it's fence post and. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So heart wood is actually dry and has a lot of oils, resins. So it's very resistant. Sap wood is usually wet and it's still moving water, right? So whenever you are carving, let's say this is an intact trunk, right? And you're gonna carve it. You can remove that first layer of sap wood when you go into the hardwood, right? And then you can carve some more and you're going into the hardwood, which is the purple section, right? It's dark from all the oils and resins in the wood. That makes it durable, that makes it long lasting. But then if you hit sap wood <laughs> again, yeah. then that's where you're moving into the dangerous area. So you can remove the white, move into the purple, <coughs> but if you start moving into the white again, you're going too deep. Can you remove the, remove the sap wood all the way around? No, 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 no. Because all around, all around this tree, there's a layer that's the living bark, right? And this is pretty much what produces wood to the outside, right. so silent to the inside, flowing to the is outside. Is there a percentage of that that you have to leave intact on your main? I would say don't go into this sap wood if you don't want to kill off this live vein. That's how deep you can go. When you so around the percentage around, junipers are quite tolerant of just living on a really thin live vein. Old junipers, they don't have an intact trunk. They just have a single snaky, bulging muscular live vein. 
going up around what is just a dead carcass. Mm -hmm. That's what old, old junipers look like. And you can see that I have carved this wood, and the lifeline is still pretty thick. But I expect that over time, this lifeline will naturally reduce and just, you know, dead bark will peel off from the sides and it will just be like an inch wide. And then when that lifeline is just an inch wide, it will start to become fat and become wide and wide and it really pops out from the wood. And that's the look that we aim for in junipers. That's the oldest kind of look on them. So talking about, how to finish wood on trees. This is my preferred way to do it. Just a die grinder. These are uh, abrasive nylon brushes. So these brushes, they kind of act like a sandblaster, but you don't have to get a sandblaster cabinet and get all the sand and get all dirty with sand. But these guys will actually erode the wood, erode the softer layers and really make those details pop out, okay? These you can get in Amazon, eBay. Uh, I think the maker is the uh, 3M, the you know tape maker. Uh, so a brace of Harbor Freight sells them. They sell the actual wheel <laughs> right. in different grits. Of course, you want to get the higher number because that's the finer grit. And with the fine grit, you get to preserve more detail. If you have really big cut marks, then you don't really need the finer grit. You want a more coarse grit because you want to actually smooth out those cut marks. But if you want to bring detail out, you pretty much want one or two wheels top. So to make the work faster, you can actually stack these wheels, make four or five wheels in the same, in the same uh, mandrel. Um, if you want to bring out detail, which is what I'm gonna do now, I will actually remove one of these and just keep one one wheel because it could cut into the grooves better and kind of bring out the detail better. So that's what I'm going to do now. So those are just nylon and bristles with grit? Yes, a bright, uh, grit on it. I think they're called abrasive bristle discs. Yeah, well, that's I've seen sand paper that way, I've never seen nylon. So this is a spent one. If you guys want to yeah. pass it around, I'll just I'll just sit, take a moment to set this one up with one bristle put on. You get the same one at like a home store or something. Yeah, you're paying like twice the price at Harper Freight. I I do some of this stuff too. Uh, I don't do it. I, I don't have a lot of big trees that get out and have wide I mean, it says, yeah, well, the mean, has all. I've bought it with Harbor Bay before. These Yeah. So you'll see these guys, they run out pretty quick, but they're cheap. You can, you can get oh, like yeah, the 30 yeah. in, in a pack. So, yeah. for example, this tree took two discs. That's what this guy ate up. A bigger tree, you might need you know five to 10. Mm -hmm. So the trick here is you don't want to run them too fast because no. they will burn rather than just uh, sand the wood. So you want to use uh, a speed regulator for the die grinder. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want, you can also get this at Harbor Freight. I'm not sponsored by them. <laughs> but you can regulate the speed and these guys run 25,000 RPM you can bring this down to 10,000 RPM ideally you would want a, a higher quality regulator so you can get it down to 5,000 RPM that's the ideal speed for these uh, for these guys they just going off on and off that's what so the Dremel would be too weak for uh, they make it in Dremel size too, yeah. because you you need to get into the crevices too. So I do. Well, I mean, there you can control right on the. Yes. The speed. Yeah. And there's also variable speed die grinders also. Oh, yeah. so. The shaft on this. However, Dremel equipment costs a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Dremel attachments and things are really expensive. Mm. Yeah, they fix it. They burn out real quick. 
I think the Dremel actually makes an actual disc, like a like a it like is, an actual yeah. mini disc. But you know, it, it's expensive. It's and expensive. It burns out. And, it burns out. and you have well, to get a new one. The mm -hmm. So you might as well get them at Harbor Freight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or yeah, check Amazon and things like that. You can get it. I don't know. Forty years. Harbor Freight. I've never burned an option. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, a question, tools, it's more a question of not being strong enough to do something fast. Yeah. You, know, you just don't overload your tools. Right, right, right. 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 Okay. I, I've never burned one. Is it better to practice on a dead tree? Is that a piece of wood? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or a piece of wood you buy and practice on? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, it's always good to practice before you do this on, on live trees. Go to the pet store and buy a purchase branches from birds or something or now so this would be this would be top speed and you can hear it oh, no. and this would be minimum speed Just, you want to do it lightly. You don't want to burn the brush. You don't want to erase the detail. This is just slightly scratching the surface, removing soft fibers, and making hard fibers stand out. So the wire brush would be too much. A wire brush would be too harsh. If you have a wire brush and you want to go like you know the elbow grease way, I would recommend um, that golden metal. I think brass. Yeah, brass. Right. Brass brush is softer. I used to old toothbrushes and stuff too. No, that one, that one, they wrote the wood, but it right. will clean it. Yeah. thing about the, the bristle disc is that it's quite flexible so it can go in between the crevices you know that's something that you can't do with an actual metal right. brush so if you see here we have brought out a little bit of detail probably I will go a little bit more to kind of disguise the cuts a little bit and it smells good. Smells good. <laughs> now, the, will it stay so that this guy, color, or some, will it get a darker mm -hmm. color, or change color over the over well, the wood? I well, actually wood, Bruce, get up there, Bruce. Show them how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, you're, you're how much time, time does it take to pay a tree like this? It took me about an hour between the big wheel and the small Dremel wheel to get into all the crevices, but you can actually see that there's nice detail that comes out. Oh, how long how long ago is that? Did you do that to get that color? Right? I just did it like yesterday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know how long it's going to stay that. Uh, that this nice color probably color. will stay like less than three months, three. and then it will start to oxidize and kind of turn grayish. A grayish, whitish. okay. Do you treat that with any well, kind of chemical? Well, it would be nice if it stayed that color. Yeah. 